Buddha is like a doctor. The Dharma is like medicine. We all have diseases in our minds. Not necessarily the really heavy kinds of diseases that they put you in an institution for. But we suffer from greed, aversion, delusion. We suffer from the hindrances, the fetters. There are long, long lists of the problems in the mind. And so we want to make sure we take the right medicine. When you think of the Buddha as a doctor, we have to think not of modern doctors who run a lot of tests. You walk into the office and they don't ask you all that much. They take your blood, they listen to your heart, then they give you a diagnosis and send you home with the medicine. Sometimes they'll actually give you the shot themselves. Back in the old days, it was very different. You went to see a doctor, the doctor would have lots of questions for you. Even today, you go to a Chinese doctor, a traditional Chinese doctor, and they'll ask you to give a, give a thorough report on how you're sleeping, how your digestion is, all kinds of things. In other words, you have to learn how to be observant of yourself if you're going to get anywhere with this medicine. And as was often the case with doctors in those days, they would give you the list of ingredients you needed to get for the medicine, but you had to go find them yourself. In the same way, you have to administer the cure. The Buddha lays out the, the pattern. This is what the disease comes from. This is what it means to be cured. It gives you advice, but the work is something you have to do yourself. Again, this requires that you be observant. If you take the wrong medicine or the Buddha's image, if you grab hold of the water snake the wrong way, suppose you need to get some venom from the snake, because there are kinds of medicines that would actually involve poisons of different kinds. If the, dis if the medicine was right for your disease, the poison would actually help you. If it wasn't right, it could harm you. So we try to get that water snake. That was his image for grasping the drama. Notice that you do grasp the drama. You hold on to the practice, but you have to hold on right. And then you take the medicine. Now in some cases, like with concentration practice, you want to make sure that the medicine is right for you. This is one of the almost defining features of the forest tradition, is that they don't have a defining meditation technique. And John Lee probably worked out the most complete guide to concentration, but it's not the only one. The important part of concentration is that you feel comfortable with the object. You find it interesting, something that engages you. If it puts you to sleep, it gets the wrong object. Fortunately, with the breath, you can work with the breath in lots of different ways. Of the various objects, it has the most variety in the sense of you can use it to wake yourself up, you can use it to calm yourself down. You can use it as an object of concentration, you can use it as a basis for understanding the processes of fabrication that go on in the body and the mind. So it becomes an object for insight. But you have to learn how to observe when you stay with a breath of a particular kind. Does it work? If you change the breath, does it work? If you figure out all the different ways you might be able to work with a breath and nothing seems to work, then there are other topics you can focus on. Recollection of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. These are good medicine for times when you're feeling discouraged. You think about the Buddha, how many people in the world have put that much into finding the truth the way he did? And then he found he didn't sell it. He offered it freely to everybody who was ready to learn. And 
same with the Sangha. Sometimes it's easier to relate to the Sangha. Because when you read about the Buddha's path, it seems to be totally determined right from the very beginning. No moments of weakness. Whereas when you read about the, the stories of the different Ajahns or the stories of the monks and the nuns and the Teri and Teragata, they had their weaknesses, and it's easier to relate. But they were able to overcome those weaknesses. Some of them were suicidal, but they came to their senses. Some of them were discouraged for many, many years. The practice didn't get anywhere. But they didn't let that get them down. That kind of contemplation can be encouraging. And again, like the Buddha, when they attained the truth, they didn't sell it. Years back, John Fuang was alive. and different members of what you might call the, the Dharma Press. They have these monk magazines where they go around and interview the Ajans, ask them about their life story, take, the, take what they learned back to their office, add a few extravagant details to make the story more interesting, and then sell it. John Fung refused to sit for an interview with them. As he said, the Ajans put their lives on the line. When they came back, they had the genuine Dharma, and they didn't sell it. And these people have who knows what. It has a price. And that's the way most of the world is. People get something good, and they try to figure out how to make money out of it. But the Buddha was noble. In addition to being a doctor, he was a noble doctor. He offered his medical advice. He offered his medical knowledge for anybody who wanted it totally for free. Sometimes thinking about that can be very inspiring. It helps keep you on the path. The purpose of these contemplations is to get you back to the breath, because that is home base. And it's in the interaction of the body and the mind that you learn an awful lot about the mind. When you're feeling lazy, you might want to contemplate death, realizing it could come at any time. And the question always is, are you ready? And the answer almost always is, not yet. So ask yourself, why? What's standing in the way? What attachments do you have? Maybe you can work on those a little bit and learn how to think them through. See the attachment as something strange. Why would awareness want to hold on to that, especially when it's going to drag you down when you have to leave? Contemplate the parts of the body when lust arises or when pride around your body arises. If you have the opposite problem of a really bad relationship with your body, focus on somebody else's body first. So you realize that every body, every human body, when you take the skin off, it's hard to look at. This is what we all have inside. This is where we're all equal. This, the purpose of this contemplation is to equalize everything and to realize that the value of the body doesn't lie in the parts that, or the aspect that gives rise to lust. The value of the body lies in your ability to use it to do something good. And there's goodwill for times when you're angry. First, you start with goodwill for yourself. Are you showing yourself goodwill by allowing yourself to get taken over by the anger? Well, no. Then why do you do it? What's the appeal? It's important that you approach goodwill practice not simply as a visualization of cotton candy spreading all around the world. It's a contemplation to make you dig down into the areas where you harbor ill will and ask yourself why. 
You're not pretending that they're not there. You actually have to dig them up and learn how to contemplate them in a way that allows you to see that once you bring them into the light of the day, they just kind of shrivel away. They really don't have that much appeal anymore. When you gain insight into something, it has to involve seeing it come, seeing it go. You have to learn how to see your anger come, see your anger go, and then ask yourself, well, when it's coming, what comes along with it? When it goes, what happened? That gives you a sense of what the appeal is. That's the next thing. Well, why do you like getting involved with the anger? What sense of power does it give you? What sense of righting wrongs does it give you? But then you look at the drawbacks. How many wrongs get committed under the power of anger? You've got to learn how to balance them against each other, the appeal and the drawbacks. And then by cutting through the appeal, you learn how to find the escape. If you don't admit the appeal to yourself, you'll never be able to see where the escape is. This is one of the hard parts of a lot of these defilements, is that we like them, but we don't want to admit to ourselves that we like them. And if you find yourself dealing with something that seems threatening that you're not quite ready to handle, go back to the breath. Because the breath is the Buddha's basic tonic. You add other ingredients to the tonic as necessary. And if you find that some of these contemplations are actually causing trouble, okay, you realize well, that's not a medicine for you. That's it's got a little poison in it that may be right for somebody else's particular problems, but not for yours. You've got to learn how to be self observant. To diagnose your problem and to also check your progress as the medicine hopefully is doing its work. So this course of medicine requires your participation as well as the doctor's. You have to be an active participant in bringing health to yourself. Which means that the discernment and wisdom that you bring to the process will have to develop over time. There will be mistakes. There will be setbacks. But basically what you're learning how to do is training yourself to be a doctor too, starting with your own, with your own diseases. You don't want to get involved in other people's diseases until you've cured your own. You may look at them and see, oh, that when people get angry, this is what it looks like. That's probably what my anger looks like. When people get greedy for things, this is what it looks like. This is what your greed looks like, too. Use other people's defilements as mirrors for your own. But your main emphasis should be on focusing on curing your problems. You've got to learn how to be a doctor for yourself first before you can give any kind of advice to anybody else. And that's how the cure is affected, and that's how the whole purpose of the Buddha's teaching is affected as well. There's a word in Pali, atta, A-T-T-H-A. It's not atta, atta, A-T-T-A means self, but A-T-T-H-A, atta has several meanings. One is meaning. It also means benefit. The fact that the same word is used means that the meaning of the Dharma it comes when you realize the benefits. The Dharma is meant to be put into practice, and its meaning, its whole purpose, is to be put into practice and give the benefits to the mind. This is a performance art. And so the cure is the atta of what this is all about. You don't hear that word much here in, in the States. In Thailand, it's often used in, in tandem with Dhamma. That's what makes the Dhamma complete, when you reach the benefits for which these words are meant to serve. A 
otherwise you can hear the Dhamma and analyze it, but you don't know the meaning. It's only when you've tasted the benefits you know, oh, this is what that was for. <laughs>